Assalamu alaikum, I'm Avalon, and today I want to film a video about why I converted to Islam, kind of my background, and how I ended up here. So I have my notes below, so if I'm looking down, that's what I'm looking at because I don't want to forget any parts. Um, so briefly, I'll just touch on kind of my background, a little bit about me, and how I grew up. So I'm actually from the U.S. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. And I currently work at a nonprofit where I work with middle school students. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology last year in 2020, and I'm currently 22 years old, about to be 23, inshallah. Um, so in terms of how I grew up, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm American. My family is white, Christian, conservative, like that's kind of the environment I grew up in. And although... I came from a Christian conservative home. I was always exposed to people from different religions and cultures and races because I can really remember as far back as far back as I can remember. remember um, I know I had friends that were black, Hispanic, Asian, Arab, and I knew people and had friends that were Muslim, Buddhist, agnostic, like just all kinds of different races, cultures, religions. So I was never unfamiliar with other cultures I would say because that's an awesome thing about Southern California you get to meet people from all over the world and all different types of cultures so although I came from this Christian background I definitely wouldn't say I was too sheltered I think I knew people from different uh, walks of life and again different cultures and everything and I don't remember the first time I actually like heard about Islam because, again, I didn't come from a place where it was like everyone was white, everyone was Christian, and nobody even talked about other religions. So I don't really remember the very first time, but I feel like the first friend I had who was Muslim was when I was like 10 or 11. So obviously, pretty far back, I knew Muslims. So it was never... Like, Islam was never something that was super weird or foreign to me. I didn't know that much about it growing up, for sure. But it was never something that I was like, oh, what's that? You know what I mean? Like, it was kind of always a part of my life. It was kind of always there. Um, so I was very dedicated to Christianity growing up because, again, grew up in a Christian home, very, very Christian home. Um, and I, you know, decided I was a Christian when I was only four years old. And I spent 15 years as a dedicated Christian, always going to church. And obviously, a lot of those years, I was just going with my parents. But even in high school and when I was a little bit older, I was still pretty dedicated to it. But I became disillusioned with the church I was going to, with the faith in general, and just kind of with religion in general, actually, not just Christianity, with the religion period, towards like the middle years of college. That's when I started being like, yeah, I'm not interested in this anymore. I'm not Christian. And I spent a solid two years as agnostic. Because, again, I just was disillusioned with the re religion. I didn't really know what I believed, but I knew I did not want to be Christian anymore. So it wasn't, to and wasn't till towards the end of my college experience until... So it wasn't until towards the end of my college years that I decided, you know, I just feel something's missing and I feel like I need religion back in my life in order to feel whole again. Like, just, you know, there's a kind of a hole in my heart and, and I need religion. So in terms of kind of like a breaking point that finally brought me to Islam, I would say the breaking point was when I started struggling with mental health and I would occasionally have panic attacks or, you know, I never got diagnosed or anything, but it basically felt like panic attacks. And in context for this time, um, I was incredibly busy, I had several jobs, I was doing research on campus, I had just so much going on. Um, and in addition to that, I was in my final years of of undergrad. I was like about to finish college. So so obviously that's a very stressful time in and of itself because you're finishing up classes, you're making sure you're actually going to graduate, you're getting ready for graduation. And then not to mention the pandemic had just hit the U.S. So I had just gone online with all my classes and that made it even harder. It was just so stressful. I stressed about the pandemic. I was stressed about honestly just a million things um, and on top of that again <laughs> I was also going through a breakup so this is like over several different months and I started thinking about Islam a little bit before this but 
the breaking point was definitely when all of these things hit and I just was so, so stressed. And the reason I was having panic attacks every once in a while was really because I was scared about what was going to happen when I died. Um, I was scared about what the meaning of this life is and like, what am I even doing here? Because I think that can happen when you get really stressed. You start questioning, like, what am I even doing here? Like, what, why am I stressing myself out like this? Like, what is this life for? Why are we even here? So I feel like all of that stress kind of brought out these questions that I didn't have answers for. And that definitely sent me into, like, panic mode. So that's really why I was having the panic attacks. And I just knew, as I mentioned earlier, like, something was missing. Something got, like, something had to break, you know? Like, something was... I, I had to fix something and I kind of like wasn't really sure what it was at first but then I realized you know I think I do still believe in God and I do need like a religion back in my life but not Christianity like I can't go back to Christianity because clearly I tried it out for 15 years and it didn't work so why would I go back to it there's too much I don't like about it and so I need religion but not Christianity that's kind of where I was and the reason Islam was the one that I chose or the one that I even started investigating was because as I mentioned I was going through a breakup but before the breakup um, the guy who I was dating he was a Muslim so I would ask him when I was going through these feelings of what is life you know what's the afterlife and all of that I would ask him about his religion and I had already dated Muslims before and had friends who are Muslim so it's not like I knew nothing like I feel like each person that I knew in my life before Um, who was a Muslim, kind of gave me like a bit and a piece of what Islam was all about and and helped me understand it a little bit better. But I never really out like went out of my way to ask those questions. But with him, I was going out of my way to ask the questions to learn more, you know, why do women who wear hijab, why do you pray so often, all of these things. So I asked him a lot. But I also reached out to a local or a couple at a local masjid who basically like were set aside just to talk to reverts or people who wanted to revert. And um, it was a, like I said, it was a couple and the wife was a revert herself. And they gave me a lot of insight. They gave me books that I still have that I read and like it helped me understand Islam more. And they just helped me so much. More than anyone in my life, like they helped me with understanding Islam the, the best. And just every question I had for them and everything they told me made so much sense. And it just, I just knew that this is what I was looking for. I knew that this is what I needed in my life and it was what I believed. And actually the second time I met up with them was when I said my Shahada. Alhamdulillah. So that was in March of 2020. So next I kind of want to touch on specifically why I left Christianity, why Christianity wasn't working for me, and some changes in my lifestyle since converting. Of course, I didn't convert directly from Christianity to Islam, but some of the changes in my lifestyle um, between those two religions that I practiced. So I feel like the biggest thing that drew me away from Christianity, well, I guess the biggest thing was that a lot of the people in the church I went to and just any church that I had gone to previously were pretty judgmental and pretty negative and that definitely like turned me off to going to church and being around them but that was just kind of an initial thing or like a surface level thing because I was like you guys are not practicing what you preach you're not practicing what Jesus told you to do like I just I don't really like the vibe around these people so Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh you guys my name is Joshua Angel no I am not related to Chris Angel and this I don't know how long I've been growing it for since I was like, you know, 15. I'm 30 now. All right, guys, well, in today's video, I'm gonna share with you how I became a Muslim, right? How I reverted to Islam. Well, alhamdulillah for that. I do wanna say thank you to a new person channel for allowing me to share my story with you guys. Inshallah, you're gonna get tremendous value. Without further ado, let's jump in. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hamdan kathir and tamu barakan fi. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa min wallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa you guys. Hopefully you enjoy this beautiful view, especially if you think that the video sucks. At least it has something nice to look at, inshallah. So guys, we'll jump right into it. Alhamdulillah, I've been Muslim for the last eight years. And the crazy thing is that I never expected to be someone who claimed to be any religion. Because for basically the majority of my life, I was considered, or I'd consider myself, 
an atheist or agnostic, you know, some, somewhere along those lines, right? And I was always against having a religion, not for other people, but for myself. And, you know, that's how I lived the majority of my life until I, uh, you know, chose to have mercy upon my soul and got me to a slam. Now guys, prior to a slam, I was a heavy metal guitar player. I was a heavy metal musician, long hair. I mean, my hair was longer than the beard. You know what I'm saying? It was like mid back, long hair, don't care. Screw authority, you know, just being real guys. Pardon me, but you know, that, that I mean, that was just, that was my mentality, man. And from the time I was 15 to the time I was 22 when I accepted the slam, I lived and breathed heavy metal, man. And not just heavy metal, but music in general, man. I love jazz, blues, you name it, man. I was into it. I even like some hip hop and rap, gangster rap, you name it, man. You know, I was into it all. But, you know, metal, metal guitar, uh, guitar ship, musicianship, that was my deal, man. And I spent every waking moment trying to be the greatest guitar player in the world. And just to give you an idea of how dedicated and serious I was when I say that I tried to, you know, I was working towards being the greatest guitar player that ever lived, man, I spent $1,600 on my guitar. I had a two-tone Dean Razorback, Dimebag Daryl Razorback, and it cost twice as much as my first, <laughs> as my first car, man. And on top of that, to give you a type of mindset that I was in, just kind of sharing you, man, and being real with, you know, who I was, man, the band that I was in was with my younger brother and my best friend at the time. And, you know, I wanted that band to be called Deny Your Maker. <laughs> oh my gosh, I just scared the crap out of this lady, man. I was trying to adjust the camera and get in focus and she just stopped dead in her tracks. I was like, I ain't recording you, don't worry. <laughs> I ain't gonna make you YouTube famous. Well, now you kind of are, but guys, that just kind of shows you the mindset that I was in. And, you know, it kind of shows you that Obviously, I wasn't looking for religion. I wasn't looking for Dean. I wasn't looking for a slam of all religions, right? Some who, you know, most people consider the, to be the, the strictest of religions, which is not the case at all, but, you know, that's just a perception that most people have. So, it caught me more than anybody off guard when the law started opening up my mind and my eyes and my ears and my heart to El Islam. So obviously the most pressing question then becomes, dude, Josh, how the heck did you become, how did you go from being a head banging, lead guitar shredding dude, to being a Muslim, man? Well, it's pretty simple. I actually met a Muslim. Yep, your boy met a Muslim. And not only Muslim man, I actually met a Muslim sister. Now I know what you're thinking, man, that's haram, dude. What are you talking to a Muslim sister for? And I get that, Ak. I get that, but I wasn't Muslim at the time, you know? I had no idea. I didn't know about the halal and haram, man. And, you know, that was honestly the only way that someone with my attitude, with my belief system, you know, with my mindset, that was the only way that I would even consider listening to what anyone had to say about Islam. You know, of course, like, you know, I had... I wouldn't say I had Muslim, I had Muslim acquaintances, right? We'll just be real, dude. You know, I used to go to the tobacco shop and buy cigarettes from Muslims, man. And I'd see them praying and stuff. And, you know, they were always cool with me. Um, one time I seen the guy, you know, I seen the brother in Sajud and I thought he was taking a, taking a nap or something. And I'm like, subhanAllah, what's this guy doing, right? And so guys, prior to meeting that Muslim sister and actually getting to know her. I'm Aisha Rosalie and I'm a convert to Islam. So I was brought up with no religion. My parents were not religious at all. Um, I went to a school that sometimes, you know, we went to church a little bit, but I never really understood religion. And I experimented with lots of different religions before I found Islam. So I experimented a little bit with like Hinduism and Buddhism and all these kind of things, even Christianity, I, I tried it out, but nothing really stuck to me until I became Muslim and obviously it stuck, <laughs> like it stuck. So I was born in Cambridge in UK. There were some people in the village that were religious, but we never really had religion. Um, my grandparents went to church a little bit, but uh, I never truly found God until I became Muslim. I think when I was a kid, I believed, but not through my parents' influence, because my parents didn't ever believe in a God. But I remember being a kid and talking to God all the time when I was a kid, but I never told my parents because 
I didn't really know anyone who was religious, so I had that really sort of uh, innate feeling that there was a creator, but I never really, truly sort of internalized it until I became Muslim. I had some Muslim friends in the UK. I knew some Muslims, but the first Muslim country I went to was Turkey. I'd never been to a Muslim country before. It was the first time I went to a Muslim country. And I was very lost when I came here. It was around a year ago. I came here to Istanbul. And I was very lost in my life. I, I was reaching a point where I think if I carry on as a non-Muslim, I would have really ended up being a bad person. I was really at the end of my character. I was here and I met so many Muslims, obviously, as a Muslim country. And I went to a mosque for the first time. And that's where I really discovered Islam. When I first visited the Blue Mosque here in Istanbul, I never planned to become Muslim. It was never an intention of mine. It was just, I was doing touristy things and I just thought I would visit. And when I was inside the mosque, I had um, tasbih, I had prayer beads, because I bought them for a friend in the UK as like a gift. And I took them out of my pocket and I searched on Google what you're supposed to do with them. And I started doing subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar inside the masjid. And I was not Muslim. I didn't even know what I was saying. I just wanted to try it out. And I couldn't pray. I didn't know how to pray, obviously. I didn't even really know the Muslims prayed. But I could see people praying in front of me. And I just sat there and I just did tasbih. And I came out the mosque and I heard the azan for the first time when I came out of the mosque. And I remember just stopping in the streets and I was just so overwhelmed by what I was hearing. It just hit my whole body. And that's when I went back to my hostel that I was staying in and I found an English copy of the Quran in my hostel and I picked it up and I started reading there and then. The, so I, from the masjid, hearing the azan to start reading the Quran within hours with no intention of becoming Muslim beforehand or even discovering Islam. I had no reason to. I was literally just visiting the place. And I started reading the Quran and then I downloaded the... Um, Muslim Pro app on my phone and started reading it there and I just never stopped reading. I read the whole Quran and then I declared my Shahada after I finished reading the Quran. But it was a journey and I actually, this was the first hijab that I brought and I brought it um, before I went into Blue Mosque for like respectful reasons because I didn't want to be disrespectful to Muslims going inside and I literally never took it off. <laughs> like the first time I put it on, I, I never took it off. It just stayed forever. And in terms of differences in my lifestyle now, first of all, huge one, I don't drink anymore, of course, because I'm Muslim, so I gave up drinking. And I can't say enough how happy I am that I did, because I've seen firsthand in my own family how alcohol can just ruin people's lives. And honestly, nothing really good comes from alcohol, um, other than, you know, the only thing that comes from it is, is poor behavior, and sometimes it's fun times or whatever, but you won't probably remember them or you won't remember them as they really happened for sure. I can attest to that from my own experience before converting um, because it just impairs you and it, it doesn't do anything good for your health. So I don't at all regret that. Sometimes I still miss alcohol from time to time because it was a part of my life. It's a part of my like lifestyle and culture going to bars and everything. But even when I miss it, I'm like, it is not ever <laughs> worth drinking again. Like I'm so happy I gave that up. And other than that, I just feel so much more fulfilled as a Muslim than I did as a Christian. Now again, guys, this is, this is brief. This is not a long, articulated, deep, drawn-out explanation as to why I accepted Islam. These are just brief, brief, a brief summary, right? Number one is that Tawheed is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fact that Islam has negated every single route, every single path, has set up boundaries, right? It has made it impossible for you to worship other than Allah. The amount of detailed explanation, and of course it is from Allah, so it is perfect, right? It's perfect that it is so well thought out that, again, there's just no way that if you study Islam that you can worship other than Allah. It has just negated every single path to worshiping other than the creator of the heavens and the earth. So that's number one. Number two is the justice of Al-Islam. Meaning, 
when I started reading about Islam, what it means to be a Muslim, what Islam teaches, and it said that just because you say the Shahada, the Kalamata Tawheed, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammad sallallahu right? You testify there's no way they worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi is his last and final messenger. That does not mean that you are 101% guaranteed to not go to the hellfire. And I said, man, that is so just because, you know, growing up as a Christian or raising, you know, raising a Christian household, it was basically like, all you got to do is believe. You don't have to change your actions. You can go to church on Sunday morning, leave the church and go do everything that the pastor just told you to avoid and all is good. You're going straight to heaven, right? And I just couldn't accept that. Like I always say, paradise, Jannah isn't that cheap. It's much more, you know, much more expensive than that. And so when you see that Muslims, some, you know, may Allah protect us, some of us unfortunately will have to go to Jahannam to the hellfire before we can actually be given permission to enter paradise, man. I just thought that was very just and it, uh, it further cemented my belief in Al-Islam. And the third and final reason is because we are commanded to seek knowledge. It's not recommended. It's not, hey, you know, if you get around to it. No, it is a commandment and an obligation to seek knowledge, which again, going back to being raised as a Christian, you just don't ask certain things. You just accept certain things. You just go on blind faith. And, you know, again, anyone who has any type of, I'm just, I'm just being real, who has any type of analytical intellect, you know what I mean? Someone who wants to break down things and truly understand them. You just can't accept blind, you just can't accept things blindly. I, at least I can't. And so when not only, like again, it, not only are you recommended, is it a recommendation to seek Islam, but it is an obligation and mandatory that if you do not understand something, if there's something that is not clear to you, that you have to, as Allah says, if you don't know, then ask those who know, right? You're commanded, that's a commandment from Allah. Go figure out the answer. And so those are the three main reasons why I found in my heart I was never really given sort of proof, you know, there was no one come up to me and they were like, here's proof, there's a God, you need to become Muslim. I never had that. It was just more of a feeling and emotion. And through reading the Quran and seeing the beauty of Islam, and I think the importance of charity was one thing that really drew me towards Islam. Learning about charity and how it's obligatory to give to charity, that was a huge thing to me. And learning about the Prophet, peace be upon him, his life and the person he was, that helped me a lot, becoming Muslim. And I think learning the 99 names of Allah as well really helped me. Because, you know, learning that there's someone who's a guider, someone who's always with you, someone who's merciful, all these kind of things. And there was just so many little things I kept reading in the Quran that would just give me goosebumps. I would think like, wow. And I remember going into Blue Mosque, they had this huge sign there that told you what it meant to be Muslim and the things on there were things like being kind and giving and um, there's just so many things on there that I was like if I became that person I would be a really good person and I thought wow if I can like just work on this and just build this character this is a character that I would love to have and I was just so excited for that. I went to a new converts group like once or twice but because of COVID it stopped happening because of the pandemic and everything so they weren't meeting anymore so I didn't really I was watching a lot of um, lectures on YouTube like Mufti Mank and people like this so the help that I was getting was just kind of online through these scholars from YouTube and stuff I never actually had anyone I it was kind of just me and Allah just going through this process just together. There, was, there wasn't really anyone there, to be honest. It was a very personal journey and I didn't really know many Muslims either. So that's how it was for me. I mean, definitely a purpose. <laughs> I mean, it's very cliche, everyone says it, but of course, a purpose. Um, accountability for your actions. So knowing that there's someone watching everything that you're doing and in a way counting your good deeds, your bad deeds. 
So I needed that. I needed, I needed to f know that there's someone watching so that I didn't just feel like I could just get away with whatever I wanted to do whenever I wanted it. Because if you just follow your desires all the time, you're just going to end up in this black hole. Like it's, n it's not going to lead you anywhere good. You're just going to end up worse than before you started. So knowing that there's someone watching and that you do have to do good, even if the people are not watching, you still have to do good because Allah's watching. And I think that was what was missing for me. They were the main things, yeah. I guess admittedly before I became Muslim, the only thing I knew about Muslims was through the media. And the media doesn't portray Muslims in a positive way. So I did have all the cliche views. I thought women were oppressed. I thought um, Muslims hated non-Muslims. I thought all these things. But I think coming to Turkey really showed me what Muslims are like. and. I think meeting Muslims here in Istanbul, in Turkey, was a big thing for me because the kindness and knowing that Muslims, you know, they, women are not oppressed. Women choose to wear hijab. I thought women were forced to wear hijab. I thought they were pretty much like, if you don't wear hijab, then, you know, you're shunned from this family and all these kind of things. I thought there was all this kind of forcing going on. But knowing that actually everyone does have a choice and you know, we do put it on as a personal choice, learning about that and learning how Muslims, you know, they, they love everyone, no matter if you're Muslim or non-Muslim, we're still taught to love people. And I think because of the media and the way they show how Muslims react to the West and the West first, you know, all this kind of stuff, it just put a bad image in my head. And it took a while to reverse that, it really did. It wasn't instant. And it took a lot of watching lecturers and seeing good character. The main thing is good character. It's the best dower. is seeing someone with good character. It's the best dower you can get. And that was really important. My mum was not sure at first. My mum was not too happy about it. She... I told her that I'm going on this journey, that I'm learning how to pray. And I learned how to pray before I declared my shahada. I, I experimented a lot before I officially declared my shahada. And she knew I was sort of going on this journey, but she wasn't sure that I was serious about it. So she kind of sat back and was like, you know, you can do your thing. But once she knew I was serious about it, then she started going on Google and typing in things and saying like, do you know Muslims do this and they do this and they do this? And actually it was a good thing in a way because I then had to do research myself to kind of debunk those myths that she was coming up with. So then I had to go on Google and then I had to look for more authentic sources like from the Quran, from the Hadiths and, and say, actually, you know, mum, this is wrong. You know, we don't believe this. This is just the media portraying us in a negative way. So she didn't react well at first, but now she's fine with it, completely fine. And I think because she's seen my journey, she's seen the person I become and my friends, the same thing. At first, they weren't too sure, but now my friends are really happy for me because they see how different my life is since I've become Muslim and how I've changed for the better and all these kind of things. And they're actually really happy for me. So as far as my um, family and friends' reactions, you know, at first when I converted, I didn't tell my parents and they actually kind of figured it out themselves and asked me. So I finally was like, okay, yes, fine, I'm Muslim and I you know, admitted it to them. And of course they were not happy at first and they're still not like super happy that I'm Muslim, but they've come to terms with it, I think as best they can. And you know, it still hasn't even been a year. So I'm giving them time and they're doing their best. They're, they really are doing their best to accept me as I am. So I would say things went a lot better with my parents than I initially expected. Um, I also had two brothers they didn't care. They're like, that's cool. <laughs> like, they're they're always there for me. Um, and my friends have been very supportive. They, if anything, they've just encouraged me on my journey. They've never treated me different for wearing a job or anything like that. They always hype me up. Like, it has not been an issue at all with my friends. And I think that if you convert to Islam and it is an issue with your friends and they don't want to be your friend anymore or anything like that, they are not a good friend at all. And that should never stand in the way of a friendship or or anything. So yeah, I have pretty amazing friends and they never hesitated to support me. If you're not a Muslim yet, if it's something that you've been considering, 
My only question to you is, what are you waiting for? And what I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of things that we disagree upon as, as you know, as humans, as humanity, as a, you know, as a global population, we disagree on a lot of things. But one thing that we can all agree upon is that you and I will die. That is a fact, Jack. And on top of that, we don't know when we're going to die. We have an assumption, oh, you know, 60, 70, maybe 80, something like that. But we know death can come to you like that. And the thing is, man, is if death comes to you and you heard about Islam, its teachings were crystal clear. You didn't take Islam from people who don't practice Islam, right? Meaning media, news, these different things, right? Because if you want to learn something, if I want to learn tennis, am I going to go to someone who is a bowler? No. I'm going to go to someone who is an expert, is a champion, is someone who is well known and established as a great tennis player, right? Their credentials, right? Same thing with the slam. If you want to learn Islam, learn it from Muslims who actually... I think there is something Muslims can do to help new Muslims more or people discovering the Deen. And I think the main thing is keeping good character because that is something that drew me towards Islam so much was seeing the good character of people. So just trying your hardest to perfect your character and being a, a good person is the best way to give dawah. You don't know who's going to see you in that moment. You don't know who's going to be like, oh, look at that. Look at that, you know, girl in the hijab. Look what she's doing. Oh, mashallah, that's amazing. Well, they wouldn't say mashallah because they're not Muslim. <laughs> but, you know, you never know what they're going to be thinking. So I think we do have a duty to have the best characters possible, not just for ourselves and for our own deen and for trying to make it into Jannah, but also for other people seeing us and having it as a form of dawah. So I think remaining in good character. And I think... I remember during my first Ramadan, there was a sister who brought me food. She didn't know me. She just come over and she brought me food. We were doing some um, Islamic course together. She brought food to my house for iftar. And I thought that was amazing. And that's something I'll always remember. So I think there is a duty of us Muslims to try and help new Muslims as much as possible. Even if it's something as simple as going to someone's house and giving them an iftar meal. You know, we think it's a small deed, but it's not. Especially for a new Muslim, it's a really big thing. So I think reaching out to new Muslims and helping them in every tiny way possible, it's bigger than you realize. Yeah, so there are a lot of ways to learn about the deen without having to really pay lots of money. You don't have to go and do a formal course. You can go on YouTube, for example. You can find so many amazing lectures from amazing scholars. I learned a lot about the deen that way. I think once you become Muslim, it's a lifelong journey learning. It doesn't stop after a year or two years, you know, you spend your whole life learning about the Dean as much as possible. And there are amazing sources online as well that are really cheap. Um, so I started doing a course with um, Cambridge Muslim College, they do it online, and it, you pay £20 a month and you have all these lectures and you do it in a structured way. So if you do it for three years and you follow every single lecture, they give you a, you know, a certificate, like a three-year certificate, and you learn everything from like fiqh to hadith to the sirah to tasfir, like all of the Islamic sciences you can learn online. You don't even have to go to a school anymore. You can learn even very, very complex um, sciences online now. So I think like, no one has an excuse anymore for not knowing because we have all these resources at our fingertips. So I think yeah really like spending the time just learning forever it's i think if i didn't do that if i didn't keep watching lectures and keep doing all these things i could get low in mind really quickly and i could start losing faith really quickly because you need to keep topping it up and that's why we do five prayers a day because allah doesn't say oh just you know pray to me once a month and you'll remember me forever we have to keep we have to keep learning we have to keep praying because we live in the dunya that's so distracting, we can get lost so quickly. So we have to, have to, have to keep it up or you're just gonna get lost again.